Everything in this country is based on sales. If nothing gets sold, nobody eats. But a lot of people that are li that have lived here their whole life, they're over here with a sense of frustration because of helplessness and hopelessness. So our job yes. is to take you from helplessness and hopelessness to, to a sense of expectation. You should expect to do better. So post 4th of July weekend, and uh, many different conversations were being had, especially about the economic times we're in right yes, now. Yes, yes. And so uh, coming to the show, coming to the Seven Figure Squad conversation about how to think like a millionaire, how to strategize like, like a millionaire, and obviously how to become a millionaire, we have with us Dr. Billy Williams, and uh, uh, founder and president of Inspire Nation Business Mentoring Services, and considered America's best insurance agent and small business coaching and mentoring company. And uh, 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 Billy here also has the Williams Family Investment Group, a group of more than 150 partner agencies that produce over a billion dollars a year in new and renewable renew, renewal insurance premiums. So yep. uh, we're, going, we're going to talk about a lot of issues today, Billy. So I, I appreciate Let's you. Let's do it, my man. Let's do it. You know, yeah. this, this industry has given me more than I ever thought I would possibly have in life. So I, yeah. I, let's talk about it because you guys, your audience, the people that are on here, they need to know that insurance is a vehicle that can take them wherever they want to go. It can be, it can be a, a hoopty or it can be, you know, Elon Musk rocket ship. I mean, it really <laughs> depends on what you want to do with it. So uh, Billy and I originally connected at the Agency Nation conference. Uh, we were both speakers on stage mm -hmm. and uh, you gave your, your ice cream talk. Yes. Uh, your, your infamous signature speech, ice cream talk, and obviously you wowed the crowd. And I had to connect with Billy because he's also a military veteran, Army warrant officer, uh, retired after how many years, Billy? 21 years. 21 years in the Army. Yep. And got, uh, you, you have not one, but two PhDs. Am I correct in saying that? I do, but one is, it's, it's mainly one with a concentration. Even ah, okay. though it says it's two, it was really more just a couple of extra classes to get the other one. So I don't want to oversell it, what it is. Okay. But the whole purpose of the PhD, what people have to understand, you go back to school and I, you know, as a military guy, I couldn't go straight through school. Yep. It took me 17 years to go from my bachelor's to my PhD. And the whole point was, well, you go to school for two reasons. One, to either learn something or two, to try to understand why you do something. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for mm -hmm. me, it was, it was a combination of both. I was already making money. I had owned a gym and sold a, a chain of gyms when I was 25 years old for $6 million. And while I was in the military, so I already had money. I had built it from the ground up, turned it into something, sold it and looked for something else to build. But I had no real clue what I was doing. So I went back to school to understand why that stuff worked. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I got it. Not to figure out what I needed to do. So, so, so is that how you stumbled across insurance? I mean, I, I came across it by accident and realized, man, this is something I really want to do. How, how, did, you, how did you come no, in for the No, no, for me, it was planned. Uh, I knew I was going to wow. get an insurance around 14 years into the military because at that point, I started to work on my master's degree in finance and well, it was sports finance. And so once I started to work on my degree, I started to look at all the different avenues and different things. And I realized the one thread that ran through everything was insurance. Wow. So you could have a billion dollar business, but if there was no insurance to protect it, it wasn't going to last. And then what really threw me was you had to have some kind of insurance, whether you self-insured you know, like the Googles and all those of the world, they mm -hmm. self-insure mm -hmm. or whether you went out and paid someone, you know, a, a, a particular piece of that to insure you. Right. But there was always insurance. I'm not a smart guy, but I can figure shit out. So <laughs> at the end of the day, it said, let me get this straight. Out of everything that happens in our country, the one common thread is insurance, not banking. Yep. Because there are a lot of millionaires that don't bank. There are a lot of drug dealers that don't bank. There are a lot of people <laughs> who have money in their mattresses that don't bank. bank. So it wasn't banking. It was insurance. Interesting. You know what I mean? Sure. So I chose around year 14 to say, no, this is something I'm going to learn about and something when I, 
when I get out, I'm really going to take a look at. I just happened to be lucky enough that one of my neighbors was a vice president at Allstate. And so without me even mentioning it to him, he said, dude, you're about to get out of the military. You need to come look at Allstate. You need to look at insurance. I'd already had that mindset, but he really, well, again, my grandmother used to say, if everybody says the same thing and everybody ain't talked to each other, everybody can't be wrong. <laughs> yes, you know what I mean? yes, smart so, grandma. Right, yeah. so for, for me to talk about it, for other people to talk about it, and then for my neighbor to say, dude, this is what you really need to look at, it just seemed like God was opening that door for me. So I just went through it. Really, did you, I mean, how were you growing up? How were you uh, uh, in, in, in high school? How were you in the military as it relates to money? What was your awareness and understanding about money growing yeah, up? I came, I came from upper middle class. I didn't come from poor. I didn't grow up in the ghetto. Uh, I didn't, my father was military, you know? So we lived in an area in Dallas where we were literally the only black family on the block. Wow. I mean, we had crosses burned in our yard. We had signs and nooses put up. We had, you know, get what? out of our neighborhood. I'm using nice words. Those aren't the words. Yeah, sure, you sure. You know what I mean? Yep. I went to Woodrow Wilson High School in Dallas, Texas for two of the four years that I went, two of the three years I went to high school. Uh, then I, I went to high school in Japan for one of those years as well. So I didn't come from poor. I came from... I was exposed to what success looked like through my dad. Cause I remember my dad, my dad was a Colonel. So as we, wow, went places, you know, he would get that accolade and get all that. And, but even my grandparents, my grandparents owned land, they owned farmland, they owned whatever. So I didn't grow. I didn't come from poor. I came from exposed and that's the difference is the exposure. And so I don't know. I don't, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to hog your conversation here. Uh, no, no, we, I'm, when I'm we talk about money and, and a lot of these things that people have about money, the real issue is what are you exposed to and what kind of money are you exposed to? Are you exposed to a little bit of money, medium, a lot? Are you exposed to drug money? Are you exposed to gang money? Are you exposed to, you know, job money? Or, I mean, what kind of money are you exposed to? Are you exposed to the entrepreneurial mindset? Yeah. So it's really all about your exposure. And right before I got on this live with you, I was talking to my teenagers. My, I have three teenagers at home, an 18, a 17, a 16 year old. Mm -hmm. My 18 year old goes to the University of Southern California, majoring in mathematics and economics. So USC? Because, yeah, at USC. Okay. Because that's, but I went to USC too also. Oh, nice, know. nice. Right. But that's what he was exposed to. You, you see what I'm saying? Sure. My sure. daughter is my director of chatbot development. Our company has a lot of different divisions. Sure. So we develop chatbots for businesses. And my 16 year old is, is the director of chatbot development. So from the time she was a child, all she's known is entrepreneurship. All she's known is how to make money. They've never grown up wondering, is money possible? Sure. Because they were never exposed to the impossibility of not having money. You know what I mean? Yes. The possibility of not having money. They were never exposed to that. So one of the things I love about PHP is that you're exposing people to a world that they may not have had the privilege of growing up in. And that exposure leads us to a different education. And then that education leads us to different actions. And then those actions lead us to be around a different network. Yep. And then that network leads to different values. And those values lead to different beliefs. I love it, man. See what I'm saying? It's a nice it all there. flows together. Yep. So, yeah. I, now, Billy, so you're exposed to this. Uh, we are, by the way, were you in mainland or were you in Okinawa? Uh, I was in Okinawa. I was okay. in Okinawa. No okay. kidding, you were in Okinawa. Yeah. I, was yeah. there in, I was there in Fatima. Where, where were you in? Uh, what, what I was, got, remember, I went as a child, so I could tell you all of the... Oh, okay, I got you. Okay, I got you. I was a dependent. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what's interesting is you, your dad was a colonel in the Army, mm -hmm. in the Army, correct? Yes. I'm, I'm curious, how come you didn't go the, uh, the West Point route? How come you didn't go to... You went, you I, went, here's the deal. I didn't even want to go to college. 
I went to college as an agreement with my father. I wanted to go in the military the moment I turned 17 years old. I wanted to go reserve and then go active duty. That's all I ever wanted to be was a soldier. Wow. That, that's okay. what you have to understand. That's all, okay. that was my mindset because that's what I grew up under. Sure. And I respected my dad. My dad was my best friend. Yeah. And so I, I watched him and I respected him. I mean, he was like a man's man. And that's what I wanted to be. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. And I didn't even want to be an officer. I wanted to be enlisted because my dad was enlisted, got a battlefield commission in Vietnam and then kept his, kept his battlefield commission, yep. was able to go to school went to OC, you know, OCS, did all that other stuff. And so he kept all that and just went through that. So I wanted to follow his path. Wow. You know what I mean? So I wanted to be a sergeant. So I went in and enlisted. Right. Because you're an award officer. I mean, that, right, that's, right. Yeah. I went in and enlisted and didn't switch until the warrant phase until like year 15 yeah. in the military. Wow. Wow. You know what I mean? So. Interesting. I, I have one question to ask you. It's probably my only social slash political uh, question at this yeah. whole conversation because we're going to go back to economics here in a second. There is, especially coming from being a black man mm -hmm. and a military veteran, a lot of talk has been talking about Fourth of July weekend. Okay. Like, like I'm not celebrating July 4th. I'm just curious from your perspective, your experiences. Obviously, we all have different experiences. How, how do you feel about 4th of July? What was your perspective? Is it something you want to celebrate? Because I remember there, I'm reading this letter from uh, Frederick Douglass about what it meant for him to experience 4th of July, what it meant for him as a black man to experience that. You know, you see, I celebrate this, but I have a different experience here as a, as a black man in the United States of America. It's kind of different for me. So I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, you're, you're obviously woke, you're obviously educated. Um, you obviously, you know, you know what's about, you know, you know, you know right. what's up. How, how, how did you experience being a military veteran Fourth of July weekend? I've gone through one, two, three, four different, I guess what you would call battlefield campaigns, uh, starting with Grenada. You know, when I first went in the military, I went to Grenada. I went to Panama when we overthrew Noriega. Uh, I went to Bosnia, you know, went to Desert Storm. So for me, the Fourth of July is about the fact that I was willing to lay down my life if necessary so that people had the opportunity to celebrate the 4th of July. Mm -hmm. So whether you believe in it or whether you don't believe in it, what I believe is in you have the opportunity. And so for me, I don't get that deep into it. You know, it's kind of like church or religion or anything else, whether you're Baptist or Methodist or Jewish or whatever, I don't care because I, I afforded, I was part of the team that afforded you the opportunity to have that choice. Sure. You see what I'm saying? Right. So for me, it was never a political issue. It's not a political issue. It's a choice issue. So if my neighbor says, I don't want to celebrate the 4th of July, you have that choice. Sure. If my other neighbor says, I want to, I do want to celebrate the 4th of July, you have that choice. And I'm in the middle saying, I'm going to protect your choice. Ooh, that's it. That's it. I love it. Love it. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of talk, and I just went to this website here, um, talking about the racial income inequality. Mm -hmm. Racial wealth income, uh, wealth equality. There's a gap, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and as it relates to you coming out, because you've obviously created your wealth, not as an employee, not working for the man. You became the man. You became an yeah, entrepreneur. I've, I've, you, never, I've never had a job. I always tell people that all the time. I've never... Even with Allstate, I never applied for a job at Allstate. I was given a job and I only worked it for a few months and then I became an agent. Yeah. So I've never sat down and had an interview or done whatever. It was never my mindset. Okay, never my yeah. mindset. So when we talk about racial inequality, mm -hmm. the inequality starts with our mindset first. But our mindset is a product of what we're exposed to. The key to all of this, when we talk about wealth, is exposure, okay? Now, a lot of people say education. Well, there are a lot of educated fools out there. You know, in the military, we call them cadidians, right? <laughs> you, you, know, you, you know what a cadidian is, you know, someone sure. that just really, you, you got the book smart, but you really don't have the world smart. So it's all about exposure. So I don't believe that education is going to come about until exposure comes about. Okay, there's a there's a pathway for me. If I expose you to something, 
then I stand a better chance of you taking actions that will eventually change your mindset. So our inequality is based on, in my opinion, this is just Billy's opinion, it's based on exposure. So what you do, what I do, what other people do is we expose people to opportunities and then the ones that appreciate that exposure will take advantage of it. And the ones that want to live in hopelessness, because here's the deal. I'm gonna get real deep for a second. Click. Here we go. With our viewers, okay? Yep. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go PhD. Not, not public high school diploma. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> <laughs> but I will go PhD status on this yeah, for yeah, a second yeah. here, okay? But bear with me. I'm going to keep it simple. Depression is the number one cause of violence, hopelessness, divorce, all those things. Depression. And you have to look at what makes up depression. Okay? Right. Depression comes from, uh, again, we'll use a formula. Everything for me, I have to be able to see the vision for it. So it all starts with frustration. Frustration is broken into two legs, helplessness and hopelessness. Helplessness says, I can't change this. Hopelessness says it will never change. Okay, no matter what I do, it will never change. Wow. So now when people become frustrated and they start to get that sense of helplessness and hopelessness, that turns into anger. So frustration, Helplessness, hopelessness, anger. Anger shows itself two ways. Undisciplined or lazy. Mm. Undisciplined, I'm going to do something other than what I'm supposed to be doing. Lazy, I'm not going to do anything else. If you stay angry long enough, you're going to get depressed. And depressed, yeah. depression, okay, depression is eventually going to lead to either violence okay okay or it's going to lead to self-violence so it's either outward violence i'm going to hurt somebody i'm going to hurt this i'm going to hurt whatever or i'm going to hurt myself you see what i'm saying 100 yeah, this, this all started from frustration yeah which is that sense of helplessness and hopelessness that's where our inequality starts that's why we as African-Americans, how do we get rid of that sense of helplessness and hopelessness? You see what I'm saying? Yes. Until we can eliminate that, you're not going to eliminate violence. You're not going to eliminate anger. You're not going to eliminate protests. You're not going to eliminate any of that until you eliminate helplessness and hopelessness, which is frustration, pent up frustration. So how do you eliminate that? You have to expose people to things that no longer make them feel helpless. helpless. You have to expose people to things that no longer make them feel hopeless. You see what I'm saying? 100%. See, when people immigrate to our country, they don't come over here with a sense of helplessness, helplessness. and hopelessness. Right. They come over here with a sense of expectation. I expect to have to work my ass off. I expect for things to not be handed to me. I expect to have to work five times harder than someone else. I expect to be a part of a community that's gonna support me. They come over with a sense of expectation. But a lot of people that are that have lived here their whole life, yep. they're over here with a sense of frustration because of helplessness and hopelessness. So our job yes. is to take you from helplessness and hopelessness to to a sense of expectation. You should expect to do better. If you've seen me do it, then I, then you know it can be done. So now the key is I'm going to expose you to my process so that you can expect that same process to work for you. When does, makes sense? Uh, but makes sense, beautiful. When does entitlement, does, the, when does entitlement insert itself in there? Because there's also a sense of entitlement. Like I, I'm entitled to this. I went through this. I'm entitled to this. Yes. And if yeah, I'm yeah. not getting what I'm entitled to, anger kicks in it as well. Uh, right. You you did, now that entitlement comes in at the point of frustration. Yeah. So now we're going way back to the beginning, which is frustration. Okay. We, be, we become frustrated, which leads to helplessness and hopelessness. We become frustrated when we try and we don't see results yep. or when we have that sense of entitlement 
that I shouldn't even have to try. It should just be given to me. You see, see what I'm saying? Yeah. And so if you, if you constantly believe that something should be given to you and you don't get it, eventually you're going to get frustrated. And when you get frustrated, eventually that's going to turn into helpless and hopeless. Oh, no, I'm supposed to have this and I'll never get it. Oh, no, I'm supposed to have this. And no matter what, the man ain't going to let me have this. They always going to keep me down. You know what? There are there are there are elitist and there are racist. OK, OK, OK. Elitist are if you are not economically where I am. Yeah. I don't want shit to do with you. Yeah, right. They can't wrap with you. Right. right. OK. And then there are racist. But even racism has two legs to it. There are racist and don't care. And then there are racist and don't know. <laughs> ah! OK. All you right. see what I'm saying? Yeah. OK, I see. So if, if, if I'm an elitist, and you don't, until you make a certain amount of money, until you drive a certain amount of car or a certain type of car, until you move into a certain neighborhood, I don't care what color you are, I ain't dealing with you. Sure. But once you have reached that, in my mind as an elitist, I still don't care what color you are. So elitism doesn't know color. Yep. Elitism only knows green. What, you see what I'm saying? What is, how has life, life changed for you? Obviously, as you made your move up, in, in entrepreneurship and not just one agency, not just 20 agencies, not just right. 50, about 150 agencies that you are partner agencies with. Right. Uh, in, in, your, in your business. How has life changed for you coming from retiree warrant officer mm -hmm. to now having a business that produces $1 billion a year in premiums? Money doesn't make you who you are. It reveals who you are. Okay. So my life has not changed. That I know it sounds crazy. Like I drive a 10 year old GMC Yukon that my, my family is like, dad, really? How long are we gonna continue to do this? <laughs> you know, you could go get any car that you want and you don't. My son, when I got him his first car, his first car was like a seven year old Nissan Murano or something like that, right? I didn't get him, even though he wanted an S550 which my wife drove, right, which my wife drives. Right. But for me, because I grew up understanding that money was just a tool. Yep. I don't, my life hasn't really changed. Um, my, is my house bigger than other people's house? Probably because I got five kids total and we need a big ass house. I mean, that's right. just the way it works. But my house isn't in a gated community. It's not whatever else because that's not, that's not what defines me. That's not what makes me who I am. That's why I started with money doesn't make you who you are. It reveals yes. who you are. Yes. So what money revealed to me was that I love entrepreneurship. I love helping people. I love mentoring. I love coaching. I love doing all the things that I am doing right now. Money just gave me the opportunity to do that as a living, as a life force versus doing it for someone else and letting them value me. Let, let, let me share with you um, a, a graphic from a nonprofit organization called Prosperity Now. Okay. And, and they talked about the wealth, they talked about, uh, here's a graphic about the wealth gap, the racial uh, wealth gap, okay? Okay. And it says that the racial income gap is a big problem, but the racial wealth gap is an even bigger problem. So income problem and obviously a bigger problem, wealth, wealth gap problem. And so they, you know, they, they, they did the survey uh, um, black, Hispanic, other races compared to white. Okay. Now, when I've seen this, I, Billy, I don't have the black experience, but I do have a parallel experience, uh, 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 not coming from resources, not coming from a silver spoon in my mouth, uh, uh, in, in a, uh, a middle-class neighborhood here in Chicago, the Berwyn Cicero Stickney area uh, of Chicago, serving in the Marine Corps. It's, it's not like I had an 800 credit score or a line of credit ready to go for me when I left the military. But I, I, look at, I look at this income gap, I look at this wealth gap, and I'm, think, I'm, I'm thinking to myself a, a lot of different thoughts personally. Before I go into that, I want to know what your thoughts are when you see this. What are your it's initial thoughts? What's your, what you, what you, what you, what you income reaction? Income is what we make. Wealth is what we acquire, right? Yep. So 
we our kids are taught from the time they're in second grade to go get a job okay go get a job go work for someone else and let them value you let them tell you what you're supposed to make let them tell you what you're supposed to be let them tell you when you get that 50 cent an hour pay raise okay. that's that income mentality okay. where wealth is a whole different thing there are a lot of wealthy people that didn't have a big income you know what I'm saying? Okay. But they acquired things that produced money. One of the things my dad used to tell me all the time, don't spend a dollar unless you can see how it's going to make you a dollar fifty. Oh. Don't spend a dollar unless you're going to see how it's going to make you a dollar fifty. So if you look around my office, look around my house, I got like nine extra computers, you know, <laughs> six extra. I mean, I'm just I'm just looking at all the different things. I got like nine extra headsets. I got every piece, I got like five printers, I got whatever. And most of it I don't need, but I know that those are things that make me money. So I will spend my extra money on things that make me extra money. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Sure. So the income gap for me is you, you're making money, but you're not doing anything with it, but giving it back. Okay. You're giving it back to the people who gave it to you. Where wealth is, I'm getting it and I'm doing something with it to build wealth. See, here's what a lot of people don't don't talk. Again, let me go into one of my little PhD moments again, okay? Okay, okay. I really appreciate you allowing me to just kind of talk here. I really appreciate yeah. that. Okay. Sure. So back in the 1800s, there was a concerted effort to make sure that the, fr the slaves that were freed, the poor poor white trash as they were called or the minorities or immigrants or whatever it was if you were again this is the elitist the elitist set up something that says you cannot get a business loan now Correct. you can get a loan you can get a loan if it was a loan for you to buy equipment to work my land you could get a loan if it was something that that kept you in debt or kept you in servitude but you couldn't get a loan that built wealth. That built wealth. Hmm. That still extends through today. Okay. Through today. So again, even though it's not, I guess, on paper, it's institutionalized. It's in our sure. mind. Right. That's why it's hard for people like me, you, whatever, to go get a business loan, but we can go get a car loan. Sure. Credit card. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We can go get a, a mortgage. Yeah. We can go get a line of credit. Right. We can Stood, go get a loan. payday loan. Yeah. We can do any loan that keeps us in servitude. To somebody we else. We can't get a loan that helps us build wealth. Ah. Mm. Okay. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Yes. And that's institutionalized. So if I need a if I need a, a car loan, I can go and spend two hours, and next thing you know, I drive out with a brand new car and nine hundred dollar a month payment and whatever else. But if I needed a $10,000 business loan, that's a six month process. Why? Because one, one keeps me out of, one keeps me in the income gap and out of the wealth, wealth gap. gap. Yes. Okay. So, so, so what, what's the solution to that then? So how do we get up and out? Cause obviously you've gotten up and out of the gap. Right. Right. You're on, you're on the up, you know, financially speaking, you're and on. You have also, and yes. you have also. So yes. let's let's look at we got the solution. The yep. solution is again goes back to that word I used in the beginning, exposure. Okay. What are you exposed to. to? Okay. What are you exposed to? So with me, when I walk into an agency, a lot of times I'll buy into an agency and they don't even know that William Williams Family Investment is a minority owned company. All they see are my representatives go in. We we do our pitch, we do our solicitation our sale we do our whatever they sign the contract and then they don't even know that it's the contract you know what i'm saying right, right. and so because because again most people are more elitist than they are racist okay i got Just you remember that most people yeah. are more elitist than they are racist okay but so so for me it was all about what what was i exposed to as an early child what were you exposed to when you got out of the military you met the master sergeant and the master sergeant right. introduced you to insurance yes right yes and he exposed you to a world that was out there and you embraced it now here's the deal when he first exposed it to you you didn't know what it was going to be you didn't know what it was going to become but you took the action 
Yeah. You took the action of going to the meeting. Yes. You took the action of sitting and listening. You took the action of meeting with whoever his upline was. You right. took the action. You see what I'm saying? Correct. When I sat down with Allstate and said, I wanted to be an agent, they told me, well, we want you in Chicago. I'm like, I, at that time, I lived in, in Munderland, Illinois. Okay. And I was like, I don't want to be in Chicago. Hell, I've never lived in a black neighborhood. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I am. I have. I haven't. So I'm like, I don't want to have to drive an hour and a half to my agency every day just because I'm black. So they said, well, you know, we don't really have any agencies for you. I said, well, you know what? It's okay. I'll open my own no. agency yeah. right down the street from where I live. I took the action of doing it. Now, did I know it was going to work? No, but I knew I followed the blueprint of other successful agents. I didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. I followed the blueprint. And so I just said, okay, this is how they market. This is how I marketed in the military when I was a recruiter. This is how this happened. Okay, I can do this. I can make a phone call. I can, I know to, I, it takes a hundred no's for me to find a yes. I'm good with that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because yeah, I sure. had a sense of entitlement that I was going to make five, five phone calls and get four yeses. Yeah. I never yep. had that expectation. You, you see what I'm saying? Sure. So because of that, I got exposed to good agents doing good things and I copied what they were doing and I improved on it a little bit better and I went from there. So I don't know if I'm answering your question or not. Oh, yeah, you're on the way, it. The way, the way we solve this problem is number one, we have to expose more people to opportunities that can get them out of this sense of frustration Correct. that they're in, this sense of helplessness and hopelessness. Number two, we either have to force the action on them or they have to voluntarily take the action. In the military, we went to basic training. You know what I'm saying? You didn't, they didn't say, hey, do you feel like getting up this morning? You, know, you feel like running five miles today? I know your rucksack's 40. You feel like taking it to 55? Hell no. This is what you have to do. And there are a lot of businesses that I work with. I literally have to force them to do the actions that will eventually change their mindset. So I don't, I'm not a big believer in trying to make people change their mindset. I'm mm -hmm. a big believer in making you change your action. And if I make you change your actions, your mindset will eventually catch up. Wow. That, that's a profound, that's a profound thing there. Um, I, I want to share with you another thing because uh, insurance news up magazine uh, this mm -hmm. month, I mean, it's, it's pretty interesting. You know, they, uh, they came out, this, this is on the life and annuity side of things, Billy. So okay. uh, this is the Hall of Fame and the Hall of Shame. Uh, you got athletes doing it right. You got athletes doing it wrong in terms of they're managing their finances. And you would think right, just right. because you're a celebrity and athlete, you're doing things well. But the interesting article, let me, let me share it here online. Uh, the interesting article here is, is actually not those articles. The, the best article I can share with you here is the now president of the American College, okay. George okay. Nichols. Okay. He used to be the former, uh, uh, former executive vice president of New York Life, former insurance commissioner of Kentucky. Go figure. And now he's a president of the American College on, on, on in, uh, financial services. So he's the one helping. For those of you guys who don't know what I'm talking about, he's the one who helps you take the education course to get your CLU, yeah. your CHFC, your CFP, et cetera, et cetera. And interesting perspective here says how the life insurance industry cuts can cut racism's deep roots. How have you seen the insurance industry do that in your experience? Oh, God, yeah. I mean, it, it can cut it so many different ways. Number one, a lot of times the only way that you're going to break generational poverty is to have some influx of money and life insurance. A lot of times is that money, that influx of money that cuts through generational poverty. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. And it is generational poverty. My grandmama was on welfare. My mama was on welfare. So I'm going to be on welfare. Yeah. Generational poverty. You know what I mean? Sure. The other thing is life insurance gives an opportunity. You, it doesn't matter if you got a PhD public high school diploma or PhD you know, doctorate of, 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 uh, of uh, doctorate of God, I can't even remember. I got to look at my own diploma. Doctor of philosophy. Thank you. <laughs> that, that's how important it is to me, right? I got to look at it to remember what the hell it stands for. <laughs> well, you got a doctor of philosophy, right? It doesn't really matter. The, the point is, Everything in this country is based on sales. And life insurance gives us- Wait, wait, say that one more time. For the people in the back. 
Everything in this country is based on sales. Here's the deal. If, if nothing gets sold, nobody eats, okay? Something has to be sold for somebody to have a job. So you folks that are like, oh, I'm admin, I don't sell. Oh, I'm, I'm HR, I don't sell. Oh, I'm service, I don't sell. Unless that salesman out there on the street is selling something, you don't have a job. Boom. Let's just get that straight. Yes. Okay? So life insurance gives us an opportunity to take a, what will be considered low qualified applicant and put them in a high payoff position. Okay. Where the world considers you low qualified, we don't. Where <laughs> the world considers you not having the right credentials, the right pedigree, the right education, the right, we don't. We just want to know, can you sell some shit? If you can sell some shit, we got an opportunity to take you up to a much, much higher place. And if you can't sell, we'll teach you how to sell. So. And you say the we, we as in the insurance industry. Yes. Yeah. Well, cause to me, yeah. we're one in the same. When Correct. I say we, it, it, insurance is me and I am insurance, pure and yep. simple. It, it is, you know, remember that I am Mike and you know, all that kind of stuff. Remember be, that? To be like Mike. Right. Sometimes the I feel. Industry is the he industry. Is the, that's, that's the only industry I relate to is the insurance industry. It's interesting that you, 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 you mentioned that because he says here, life insurance has a long history in black communities of providing low face final expense insurance. In fact, one of the few white people Nichols ever saw in the projects was a debit agent who came by to collect premiums. Yep. And uh, uh, the tradition showed, he says here, the tradition should grow into the generational wealth that sustained advancements in white communities because even in those case, he needed to learn some things as he got involved in the insurance industry. Mm -hmm. He goes, we were taught that you buy insurance just enough to bury you. And one of the ways to transfer wealth, despite of what we have done in our lifetime, is life insurance. It's exactly oh, what you just said. It is the only way to transfer. Now, let's go back to that, going back, because you know, I'm, I'm a little older than you. I'm, I'm almost 60. So going back, I remember my grandmother saying, I've got my barrel policy, okay? Right. Right. So that if something happens to me, I won't become a burden to you. Mm. I won't become a burden because a lot of times the only thing we leave when we die is debt. Okay. We just yes. leave debt. And I grew up again with my dad being military. I grew up with a man is either a liability or a benefit to his family. Those are your only two options. Those are your only two things you got as a man. You're yeah. either a benefit or a liability. And if you're not leaving anything, if you're not making a paycheck, yeah. you're a liability. If you don't have a job, you're a liability. Yeah. If you're not out there on your hustle, yeah. you're a liability. Yeah. If you die and leave me debt, you're a liability. So how do I become a benefit? by making sure that at least I got a life insurance policy. Sure. So that when I do die, I'm not leaving you a debt. Even if I don't leave you well, I'm not leaving you debt. You see what I'm saying? Sure. So he's absolutely, George is absolutely right in that regard that we, this is a lot of the way out. You know, I whether it's life insurance, health insurance, PNC, property, casualty, auto home, whatever, the insurance industry affords a way out. You know what I'm saying? Nowhere have I ever seen in the insurance industry pamphlet that you have to have a college degree to be an insurance agent. <laughs> or, or to own a policy. Right. Or yeah. to own a policy or any of that. So at the end of the day, think about this. For, for some of you folks that kind of slipped and slept through high school, you know what I'm saying? Yes. You slipped your way out of high school while you slept through high school. You know what I'm saying? It was me. This is an opportunity for you to be exposed to something that you can take those real world skills. Because most of the time, if if you're if you're not strong academically, you make up for it by being street smart. You True. make up for it by being having good communication skills. You know what I mean? So yes. if I can take those, maybe that lack of academic acumen and rel and change that over to street smarts, what product? will allow me to use those street smarts, you know, without selling drugs, without yep. doing whatever else, life insurance. And I've told people all the time when, when I'm out looking at people to hire, 
and I'll, I'll go out to some of the gangbangers. I'll go to the inner city. And I was like, dude, if you've got the skills to stand on the corner and sell some drugs, you got the skills to stand behind a podium and preach or stand on a stand somewhere and sell a life insurance policy or sit in a desk and sell, you know, an auto and home policy. If you've got the the fortitude, the discipline to do this, yep. and it won't lead to anything but death or jail. Dude, I got some opportunities for you that can really, really help you out. And at the end of the day, the money that you make, you keep it. You know what I'm saying? It. You yeah. ain't got to worry about somebody busting in your house, taking it out of your bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> or, or you make this type of money without having to look over your back. Yes. You know, you, you make, you so make somebody's money. Somebody's not gunning for you because they want your position because they know that's the only way they're going to make the amount of money you make is to take you out. Right. That's right. To get their position in the drug yeah, lord absolutely. pyramid, you know. Absolutely. Uh, as as we wrap up, Billy, and I, by the way, I really appreciate your time. I mean, you just, you just unfold a lot of things. Thanks for dropping some PhD on us. Oh, man, my um, pleasure, my pleasure. What, what, what would you say to somebody out there right now who's struggling because of this pandemic lockdown, who's, mm -hmm. who's been laid off not once already, but twice, and they've been deemed a non-essential worker, which is, you know, you know just, right. just crazy. Um, uh, uh, they're having a struggle about whether or not they should get this job or another job. Da, da, da. What would you tell them about the life insurance industry? What it can bring to the table for them to say, no matter if you're on the streets, if you're a server, uh, if you, if you are a, a, a struggling entrepreneur and, and I don't know if you own a daycare or a barbershop, what would you tell them about consideration of the life insurance industry from your perspective? Well, first of all, it, it's easy to get into, you know, it's low cost to get into. They're, they're, it's just too, the, the barrier to entry is so low that it doesn't make sense for you not to at least try it. <laughs> Second thing is you're selling a product that benefits so many people on so many different levels. I've delivered death checks mm -hmm. and I've stood there and seen the impact that this is going to have on this family for generations to come. Okay. Yes. For generations. So you're not just selling a product that's going to make you better. You're selling a product that makes your community better. You're selling a product that makes that that changes people's lives. It's one thing to stand in a soup line and volunteer for a few hours and feed someone for the day. But man, if you can put a product in that household that can feed them for a lifetime and not just on debt. You know, the life insurance has such a variety of products. I mean, we've got products where you literally, you pay into it. And then when you hit a certain age, you want it back. You get your money back. You know, you know what I'm sure. saying? So it's almost like, it's almost like a, a risk-free investment or a risk-free savings plan where a lot of people just don't have the discipline to save on their own. Yep. You know yep. what I'm saying? I mean, if you look at the vehicle, what vehicle has made more supposed millionaires in the United States than any other vehicle? It's 401ks. Why? Because 401, 401ks remove that lack of discipline that we won't have. That's why whenever the politicians talk about um, polit not uh, privatizing Social Security, yeah. it's not going to work yeah. because we're not disciplined enough yeah. to do it. We're talking about yeah, privatizing about all this other stuff. 401ks work because that money is taken out before I ever see it. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Life insurance gives us that opportunity to get involved in something where if we bought it, we could remove that one weakness of discipline and use it as either an investment vehicle, use it as a savings vehicle, use it as a generational wealth builder, use it as an opportunity to not leave debt. It has so many variations. And then that's, that's just us acquiring it. But if we sold it, now that gives us an opportunity to really be an enhancement to our community, not just a liability in our community. So to me, it just, it doesn't make sense for us not to, to take the opportunity. We're exposing you to it. Boom. Things like this Facebook Live, you know, we're exposing you to PHP. We're exposing you to Inspire Nation Business Mentoring, which is my company. We're exposing you to Williams Family Investment Group. And we're telling you, we're hiring, we're looking, we're recruiting. We want to give people an opportunity to get where we are. I'm a black man that owns a $1.2 billion valued business. You, you know what I mean? Heck yeah. No one's ever heard of me. No one knows about me. If I walk into Walmart, I got to get the same, I got to get right behind that same person in line, 
you know, to get a <laughs> grocery just like anybody else. But what it gives me at night is that sense of peace. Yes. You know, that sense of if I want to go out with my kids, if we want to go on vacation, if we want to go do something, I don't have to wonder where it's going to come from. Where's the money going to come from? How's this going to happen? How's that going to happen? And more importantly, my money's clean. You know what I'm saying? Yes. I got Honest. clean nope. money that I've worked my butt off and made other people better and helping them work their butt off. So whether you're a minority, whether you're white, whether you're Asian, whether you, I don't care what you are. If you're not involved in the life insurance world and you are struggling, then that's arrogance. Ego is what you do. Arrogance is what you refuse to do. Okay? <laughs> Ego is what you do. Arrogance is what you refuse to do. They're both driven by your insecurities. Understand, mm -hmm. your ego and your arrogance are both driven by your insecurities. Ego says, I'm going to blame myself when I don't do good. Arrogance says, I'm going to blame somebody else. Oh. Right? Yeah. Ego says, I'm mad at me when I don't do better. Arrogance says, I'm mad at you because you're doing better than me. See. You see what I'm saying? 100%. So if we're exposing you to this, and you're still arrogant about it, saying, I don't need them. They full of crap. I don't know. And you're looking at the success story. Success always leaves a trail. If you see the trail and you don't want to walk down it, that's your arrogance. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yes. But long story short, there's, there's no excuse if you're struggling. If, even if you're not struggling, there's no excuse for you not to at least look at this, at least expose yourself to the education of it. And then if you decide it's not for you, fine. But if you won't even expose yourself, you won't go to a meeting, you won't be on a call, you won't even expose yourself, then you're closing doors before they even have a chance to get open. Man, and robbing your family of that yeah. blessing. Uh, man, it's uh, Billy, uh, appreciate your time, appreciate your attention. For those of you watching this right now, uh, they want to follow Billy. Billy, where can people find uh, more about you? Oh, man, it's real simple. The, the easiest way is to just uh, do something on Google. Just go fix my insurance agency because that's our, that's our signature kind of brand that we use. Just go fix my insurance agency, whether that's our podcast, whatever. And it's going to bring you back to inspirenation.org. Uh, Williams Family Investment Group, for those of you that are looking for partners and investors in your agency, again, Fix my insurance, fix my insurance agency. That's why I have that one signature brand out there. Fix my insurance agency. Check out our Fix My Insurance Agency podcast, you know, which you were you were a guest on here not too long ago. Hey, honored so to be I part of it. I really appreciate that. But fix my insurance agency will lead you to everything you need to know about me, any of my companies, Williams Family Investment Group, and everything that we do. And your and your books. In your, in your books too. Oh, yeah. And I write books. Yeah. And again, just go fix my insurance agency. It'll it'll lead you to everything that you want to know. Plus, it drives up my SEO love too. So you know. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you watching this and you want to rise up, listen, I, I was saying this to our guys this morning, last night. If, you, if you're waiting on systemic change to take place, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a minute. As much politics is involved, the House, the Senate, the President – bill and then and then it goes in force it's going to take a minute so before you're expecting that you can protest and do all the stuff you want but if you want to wait for systemic change will be it which will be a minute you're gonna be waiting a minute the best way to change what's going on right now is right. Well, not just that matt, matt not, let me just jump in real quick i don't mean to bust yeah, through, but you know I, I said something earlier about elitist versus racist okay remember there are two types of races those that are racist and don't give a damn and those that are racist and don't know it so if you're trying to wait on systemic change, yes. you gotta get through both of those levels of racism before <laughs> this even has an opportunity. Yeah. And that could literally take 50 years because yeah. the people that are racist and don't know it, they don't understand why the system is broken. Why yeah. do we need to make all these changes? Yeah. I love black people. I have them over my house every day. You know, I, I go play golf with my black buddy. And I, so <laughs> they're racist and don't even know they're know racist it. because to them, this is just the status quo. So I absolutely agree with you. Guys, if you're sitting around waiting on Black Lives Matter or This Lives Matter or whoever else to, to, to write your future, man, that's a long novel before you get a chance to read it. But you can write your own future right now. 
Yep. So I'm sorry, man. I didn't mean to. Oh, 100 percent. Appreciate the interjection. Yeah. Before you uh, worry about changing the White House, I'd be worried about changes in your house. On that note, I appreciate you guys tuning in. If you've been watching this on Facebook Live, please drop your comments below. Give some love to Billy. He'll be looking at these uh, later on, uh, interacting with you later on. Make sure you like our business page here at Money Smart Guy and Seven Figure Squad. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you click like, hit subscribe to be alerted next time we upload our next episode. And uh, drop your thoughts, drop your comments below. I'd love to know what you're thinking. And for those of you looking to connect for, for people inside the insurance industry, drop a comment or send us a DM. We'll connect you with the right person in your city and state. With that being said, on behalf of Dr. Billy Williams, I'm your Money Smart Guy. You're one watch. You've been watching the Seven Face Squad. And until we meet again, continue live smart, continue love smart, and be money smart today. Appreciate you guys. Thanks for tuning in. Billy, Bye, guys. Boom. That's where I'm going right now. <laughs> Go get it, baby. All right, bye-bye. Right.